I believe we have the most important man in America today. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Frank Luntz on our program. You may have seen him on television. He's all over the place. He's telling you what Americans are thinking. And given the turmoil, not only in the elections today, but with guns, ISIS, and whatever you want to throw in there, Frank Luntz will tell you what Americans really want, really. The first book I read of his was Words That Work. It's not what you say. It's what people hear. I need to listen to that more. And also what Americans really want, really. But again, like he's, I said, he's always on television. He's, he's now polling people. He has just little squiggly lines that r- read the emotions and the positive and negative about people. Kim, what do you want to say about Frank? Well, I, I so enjoy listening to Frank because Frank has his finger on the pulse of exactly what America is thinking and Americans are thinking. And, and this is important now with the elections, with the economy, with the way that a lot of, you know, so much divisiveness happening right now. And so I've watched some of Frank's focus groups that he's done. And it's really fascinating what people are saying and what he's finding out. So that's what we're going to talk about, what he's finding out on what America's thinking today. And what's really special about Dr. Frank Luntz is that he doesn't do a radio. So I'm very honored to have him on our radio program. So welcome to the fr- program, Frank. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's, let's hope 2016 is better than last year. <laughs> well, anyway. Hey, um, <laughs> let's start with Trump because, I mean, he is a phenomenon. Right? I mean, what is Trump doing right and why is he working? I think what, given your professional you know, abilities, what, do you, what is he doing? Uh, he's doing what no other politician does which is, says what he means and means what he says. You can strongly disagree with him, and many Americans do. You can feel that he is uh, inciting rather than just communicating. But you know that what he says is what no other politician will say. It's very direct. Sometimes it's crude. But that directness is why he's doing so well. And I'll tell you, I, for the first time, having watched some of his interviews over the last 10 days. He's a much better candidate today than he was four or five months ago. He does control the news cycle. I know from my own polling that he's got a higher degree of intensity of support than any other candidate. For the first time, I now think that it is distinctly possible that he will be the nominee. And all these so-called establishment people waited and waited and waited. Well, frankly, they waited too long. And I wouldn't be surprised if many of your listeners are Trump supporters simply because he appeals to the small business owner. He appeals to, to people who feel like both Washington and Wall Street are out of control. And while I don't think he wins Iowa, I do think he wins New Hampshire and South Carolina, and that very well could propel him to the nomination. And, and Frank, how, do, how does he get away? I mean, nobody else can get away with the comments he makes about Muslims and immigration and women. Mexicans and women. How, how does he get away with that? Well, when, when you show people, when you show Trump voters that he's flip-flopped over the last 10 years, they say he's got a right to change his mind. When you show him the abusive comments he's made towards some of his opponents, his supporters will say, well, they deserve it. When you show them comments that he's made about women, His supporters will say, he's only kidding. It's just a joke. Get a sense of humor. When you show comments he's made about Muslims, they'll say, well, he refuses to be politically correct. When you show anything about Trump, that he's not even a Republican, well, the Republicans have sold out their beliefs. They have an excuse for everything that he does. And so 60 percent of Trump's voters are definitely voting for him. When you are somewhere in the mid-30s nationwide and no one is within 20% of you and you've got 60% hardcore support, that tells me that the style of his campaign is working. And it tells me that there's a, a, a measurable segment of American society that is not only fed up but prepared to make a, a radical change in who leads us. Right. One question. Does Trump have an Achilles heel that you see? Uh, I haven't seen it. If it were ever shown that Trump mistreated his people, that those who had done work for him weren't paid or, or that, uh, that uh, people were just badly treated by him or his company, people fired. You know, he, he says that he's insanely rich. Well, if, if people who weren't were on the other side of the spectrum and it were to be shown that 
He bankrupted businesses by not paying them or fired hundreds or thousands of employees. That would hurt him. Uh, but no one has shown it. Uh, it's not been a part of the political system. And so it really is a juggernaut. Do you think the Republicans are building a war chest to go after him? No. And I've heard that. And they say, well, the establishment's going to take him on. But it doesn't work that way. People who say it don't understand the political process. There are a lot of business Republicans that do not like him because of his positions on trade and immigration. That is true. But there is no smoke-filled room somewhere where people with cigars are lining up a huge war chest to defeat him. Uh, and those who are the leaders of the most conservative members of Congress, both on the House and Senate side, they don't like him. But it's not his style that they don't like. It's his substance, that they're afraid that he'll raise taxes. They're all afraid that he'll overregulate. They're afraid that he will blow up uh, uh, businesses that, that have uh, successfully sold American products and American services abroad. So there is within the business community a, a fear of Trump succeeding. Hmm. Hmm, that's interesting. But that's really interesting. But there's no internal group of people that are plotting against him. And and what about Hillary? Is she going to be the the Democratic nominee, and can Trump beat Hillary? Well, I think that uh, Bernie Sanders is doing the same thing on the Democratic side yeah. as on the Republican side. And, in fact, I want to make a pitch, and I'll do this twice during your show. Great. <laughs> that if listeners want to actually participate in these televised focus groups, if they want to get paid for their opinion, they need to grab a pencil and write down my website, luntzglobal.com, luntzglobal.com, and we pay people. We are now estimated for 2016, I will be in 37 of the 50 states doing these sessions, and we pay people. And in the last session I did, Bernie Sanders has significant support. I think he wins Iowa, and I think he wins New Hampshire. Wow. I still believe that she's the nominee, but there are a lot of Democrats who are really fed up with the lack of authenticity in her campaign, and they love the fact that Sanders tells it like it is. So once again, it's Robert Kiyosaki of the Rich Dad Radio Show. We're talking to, to Dr. Frank Luntz. As I say, he's probably the most important man in America today. He's the author of two fantastic books that Kim and I both read and studied. One is Words at Work. It's not what you say. It's what people are hearing. And obviously, people, what Trump is saying, people are hearing. And his other book, which came out in 2009, What Americans Really Want Really, it was a very both profound book. And his third book, When the Key Principles to Take Your Business from Ordinary to Extraordinary. And his website is luntzglobal.com. And again, we're honored to have him on the program. He's been a friend for years. He doesn't do radio, so it's even better that he's on. But anyway, um, why is Bernie Sanders, what's he hitting? Well, there are a lot of people who feel that the deck, to use Hillary Clinton's language, that the deck is stacked against them. They just don't believe that she's actually going to make any changes, considering how much money she's taken from Wall Street during her career. Sanders, on the other hand, is clearly not a progressive. I mean, he proudly calls himself a democratic socialist. Yes. And they like the idea, particularly younger voters, that the rules for corporations should be changed, the rules for billionaires should be changed so that there is a greater equalization. The Sanders people dislike income inequality more than any other issue, and they mm -hmm. believe that he is the most likely candidate to address it. So, what, And what other issues are you finding, Frank, that are most important to Americans today? Well, the interesting change over the last eight weeks since Paris is that national security has become the number one issue, not just among Republicans, but also among independents that there is a genuine fear that what happened in San Bernardino is going to happen again uh, in another part of the country. And they want to know what the presidential candidates are going to do to prevent it. The second issue, which was number one before that, uh, is waste for Washington spending and how the next president is going to get the debt and the deficit under control and just to simply stop taking hard-earned taxpayers' money and spending it on wasteful programs in D.C. And, and what about the economy? I mean, what about jobs? There's a lot of job loss going on. There's a whole 
you know, the economy is in crisis pretty much. Is that is that forefront in their minds? Well, what's interesting is that even though Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton keep telling people that the economy is fine, mm-hmm. Amer- the American people don't believe it. Yes. They don't think it's in crisis, but they think that it's in permanent decline. Permanent one, decline. Permanent decline. It's one of the reasons why so few Americans believe the American dream is alive and well. Uh, I saw, it was in my survey. I saw a survey that had less than 30% who believe that the American dream exists today. Half of the country believe it did exist but doesn't exist anymore. And that's because this economic mobility that had been so effective for generation after generation in lifting tens of millions of people out of poverty, they see that uh, strength in the economy failing, and they don't believe it's going to come back. Wow. And, you know, they talk about Hillary uh, going to have the Hispanic vote. And, you know, I, I, don't, I don't agree with Trump on what he said about Hispanics. I thought it was a little cruel. But anyway, um, is that going to be a factor against him? Have you done polls with Hispanics? I have. And despite what Trump says, I'm going to give him credit and I'm going to hold him accountable. He's going to do better among African-Americans than any Republican has ever done. And there are some African-Americans who are actually switching to party registration because they love Trump. Why? They love the, the confidence, and they love the bravado, and they like the idea. They actually appreciate his directness when it comes to money, and they want a piece of it. But he is going to do much worse among Latinos than Republicans normally do and worse among younger women than Republicans normally do. And so the net to that in a general election is very negative for him. You asked me a question early in this interview, do I see Trump as beating Hillary Clinton? Right now, I think he'd be, even with his ability to get votes that Republicans otherwise don't, I would be too nervous that he would lose Republicans that would normally back the party. I would expect him to lose to Hillary Clinton at this point. But let me be candid. I've gotten it wrong with him before. I'm very careful about what projections I make now. Right. What would he have to do to What would he have to do to beat Hillary? Uh, he it would it would have to require a major shift in traditional de- uh, demographics. It would require Trump to do better among working class. These are people with incomes. So now you can now I'm about to do something for your listeners, which is people with personal incomes that are somewhere between, say, 25000 and 45000 and it depends on where you live, family incomes that are somewhere between 35000 and 55000 uh, he would have to do better among them. He would have to get a majority of that vote, and typically Republicans get about 41 or 42 percent of that vote. That's not enough to overcome the, the voters that he would otherwise lose. Are they are, th- are those two categories twenty five to forty five thirty five to fifty five? Would they relate to Sanders? Then? Uh yes, uh, but Sanders' vote is much more. The Sanders vote isn't an income based vote; it's much more a generational vote. Sanders does very well among eighteen to twenty nine year olds, and in fact, if you attend one of his rallies, it is the, if you ever needed to talk to millennials, just go to a Sanders rally because they are filled with them. Hmm. And they are because he is the most, policy-wise, he's the most radical of any of the candidates in either party. Donald Trump says the most extreme things, but his policies are not as uh, anti-status quo. Sanders would bring about the most change. And, and what do the millennials want? They want their piece of the pie, and they want it now, and they don't want to pay for it. (laughs) They don't necessarily want to work for it. (laughs) Of course not. And uh, I'm pretty critical. (laughs) If people actually listen to what I say, it is much less partisan than, than what you might assume and actually much more generational. I think that the kids who are coming out of college today are horribly prepared, woefully prepared. Yes for the responsibilities of holding a job and being productive. And I think that they they want something for nothing. They want to go to college for free, and they don't want to study. And by the way, the same kids who are yelling that they should get free education are the ones that fill up the bars on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights. So I don't have that much sympathy for them. That said, 
I understand the frustration of those who see tremendous wealth on one hand and an awful lot of poverty on another. It's just I believe that it's actually the policies of the left that has created that problem and that furthering those policies will not solve it. So the, the, the other big hot top topic then is guns, and I'm, I'm sure you saw uh, President Obama crying on national television. What is your whole response to that? Uh, I don't know if it was for real or not, but it looked good. Yeah, did the, are Americans supporting guns, not guns? Also one of the most misunderstood issues. Take the NRA out of it. Take the, the 5% of Americans who would ban all guns for any reason whatsoever and take the 15% of Americans who would say there should be no gun laws at all, at all. Remove them from the equation. The other 80% of Americans believe in the Second Amendment. They believe in the importance of individuals having the right to protect themselves. But they also believe that not every gun should be sold to every person at any time, anywhere, for any reason. And the problem is that this is one of those issues where those extremists on both sides poison the conversation. The public does not want crazy people to be able to buy guns. But they also don't want the government to be able to come in and say, you've got five guns in your house, you can only have two. Or if you're going to have more than this, this number, we're going to tax you over it. Or you can't have a weapon in your home. There is, and I'm, I, 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 I've used the phrase common sense, but it's now been used by, it's now been politicized, that phrase, when it comes to guns. But they basically believe that law-abiding citizens should have every right to a weapon. They don't believe that those who are on the terrorist watch list should. They don't believe that those who have been uh, mentally unstable should. And they don't believe that an assault weapon or a machine gun should be in the hands of a 15-year-old. So th there is the public I, I, it's hard for me to explain because i could just imagine your listeners trying to twist and turn the words the best way to i'm going to say one more time the american people believe in the second amendment they believe in the right to protect yourself but that is different than any gun being sold at any time from any dealer to any person for any reason does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. And and you said uh, something about the words, and you, you, your first book that Robert and I read, Words That Work. It's not what you say, it's what people hear. 2016, what are the words that work today? Oh, that's great. I'll give you three of them. Number one is accountability. They want politicians to be held accountable for what they say. Number two is they want politicians to say what they mean and mean what they say. That's the best mm -hmm. articulation of accountability. And three is the phrase that I had trouble with just a moment ago, common sense. They think that it is so missing in politics today. In terms of business, they want businesses that are more efficient and more effective because they want to know that they can do more with less, and they want to know that whatever they're sold, whatever they buy, will actually work, and that's the effectiveness of it. Second word that works is uh, the word imagine. Imagine. Imagine, because that allows you to think in terms of the person you're communicating to, whether it's an audience of a thousand or just one individual. When you ask them to imagine whatever, imagine life of perfection, imagine having this uh, device, imagine making this purchase and what it will mean. When you ask someone to imagine it, they then think of it in their own terms, mm. in their own voice. It's the most powerful word in the English language, and I'm, mm. and I'm now starting to see it. In television ads, I'm starting to see it in business pitches because it really works. So accountable, imagine, and, and common sense? or And efficient, effective, say what you mean, mean what you say. I have three other words that uh, I'm sure the two of you use to each other when you're angry. The words, I get it. <laughs> yes. When, when you're are really you, are you hanging out in our living room or what? <laughs> yeah, when you're really angry because one of you, it did something that, that displeases the other one, and you're in an argument, and you say, okay, 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 I get it. I get it. It's communicating. I understand. It's, act it's actually acquiescence without giving in. Got it. 
Hey, the last thing I want to talk about is Ted Cruz and the evangelicals. How is that going to play? In I think Ted Cruz wins Iowa. I think Ted Cruz has a legitimate shot at the nomination as well. Uh, he has proven that both in his career and in politics that he has exceeded people's expectations. He understands the way politics works. He's an incredible speaker. He's a great debater. And his message is resonating across the country. You can see in the polling that Cruz in Iowa has surged to the lead. And nationwide, he is slowly but surely gaining on Trump. So, the, But the question is, how does the evangelical play or not play? That's my question. Oh, well, it plays in a Republican primary because Republican primary voters tend to be more religious, tend to hold their faith very dear to them. Uh, it's an important part of their life. And depending on how you define evangelical, it represents anywhere from 20% of the state, which would be a, a Nevada, which is the least religious of any state in America, to as much as 40 <laughs> Makes sense. And obviously, I guess. And, uh, is, is that why you live there? <laughs> uh, no. You know what? It, it's a great place I understand, to, understand. to study the American condition. Uh, yeah. Whether yeah. good or bad. I yeah. understand. I understand. And, uh, and then Iowa... Uh, close to half of the Republican caucus vote is an evangelical vote. Wow. Once again, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this has been Dr. Frank Luntz. He is best known for the books, Words That Work, It's Not What You Say, What Americans Really Want. Please read these books. You're in business. you got to read these books. And also, when the key principles that take your business from ordinary to extraordinary, extra his website is Luntz Global, and he invites everybody who wants to participate in his polling Please go to LuntzGlobal.com and even pay you for that. We had Dr. Frank Luntz. Like I said, I think he's the most important man or most influential person in America today because he's always got his finger on the pulse. His, his job is to figure out what Americans really want, really. And we have a fantastic book, 2009, Words at Work. It's not what you say, it's what people hear. I've heard that one a lot. And then also, when the key principles will take your business from ordinary to extraordinary. And just for clarification, Kim and I are not very political. Well, Kim's more political than I am, but I do my best to stay neutral. So we're going to take a few minutes to discuss what we heard. And, you know, Kim, one of the first things I heard was that the American people believe the economy is not dead, but it's declining. What, what did he say? Yeah, well, that's really interesting because, I mean, of course, the Rich Dad Company, we talk about the economy. We study the economy. We talk about financial education. And he said that Obama and Hillary keep talking that the economy is doing well. But the American people don't believe it, and they don't believe it's in crisis, but it's in perpetual decline, and that the American dream is pretty much dead. Yes, it's dead for about 50% of the population. Yep. And he also said that the millennials and the, the, the new kids on the block coming up, you know, they're horribly prepared, they, even though they go to school, and a lot of them want something for nothing. And I don't know if that's true or not, but... Um, they want their piece of the pie, but they don't want to work for it. <laughs> they want it for free. So they like Bernie Sanders. So let's vote for yeah, Bernie, yeah. socialist. You know, again, I'm not. I just kind of find uh, politics entertainment. And then what, what did well, he say he, about? He our, also said, didn't he say about um, Bernie Sanders too? That the the key issue with Bernie Sanders is income inequality. I mean. Well, because they want they want to make a lot of money without working. for Well, them. I understand, but I mean that's the number one issue. I mean, you got the economy, you got people out of jobs, you got terrorism, and they're worried about income inequality, and they're not even working. So I've, <laughs> yeah, millennials just come tell them to come to Rich Dad Radio, and we'll scold them. <laughs> yeah, you know the other thing I heard, which I loved, is he is Frank Frank wrote the book Words That Work. It's not what you say; it's what people hear. And he talked about the words that work. And one of the most important in 2016, one of the most important words is the word imagine. Imagine, because as, as you say to somebody, imagine this happening, it becomes, they, they own it. It becomes their idea. And accountable. Say what you mean, mean what you say, and the word's common sense. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that's what people want, but as you know, that's why Mr. Trump's winning, right? That's right. That's right. And you know what? The whole thing about the American dream and all of this, and we, we read about it, and you know, a lot of people want it the way it used to be. But you look at Trump's slogan, and it's make America great again. And I think that's relating to a lot of people. They want America to be great, and it's not so great. And he didn't answer my question on President Obama, Obama crying on television 
<laughs> you know, it, it, from my opinion, it looks sincere. You know, I don't think anybody would be happy about people killing kids. But you know, the, if it's if it's staged, I'm not saying it is. But if it is, man, he's desperate right now. You know, he's really doing his best. And I like guns, but I'm also not against murder and massacre and all that stuff. And I like what he said about 20% of the population are whack jobs and 80% are into common sense and gun laws. and Supporting the Second Amendment. Support the Second Amendment and all this. But what we hear on the news are the whack jobs. Yeah, yeah. And, and he made a good point, too, because I also agree that, that you know, you you, got, you do your background checks, but you don't sell to somebody who has mental illness. I mean, you look at all these people that are shooting people up. They have mental illness. Well, how do you it's know if somebody's gun. But how do you know? I yeah. don't know. I don't know. It's a huge issue. Another thing that I was, I was happy Obama did say is that it goes to this whole point, is that two, they thought, well, you know, 30,000 people were murdered or some, whatever every year. But 20 of them or, you know, two-thirds are suicides. So mental illness is not just shooting a bunch of people in the theater or yeah. in work. They go home and shoot themselves. So this mental illness issue is really the key because how do you know if somebody's mentally ill or not until they go and do something that proves they're mentally ill? So once again, you know, I think it was a great program. I want to thank Dr. Frank Luntz. Once again, his website is LuntzGlobal.com, L-U-N-T-Z-G-L-O-B-A-L. If you want your opinion heard, Go to LuntzGlobal.com, and if you're an entrepreneur, read his books, Win, The Key Principles That Take Your Business from Ordinary to Extraordinary, What Americans Really Want, Really, and Words at Work, It's Not What You Say, It's What People Hear. Remember, Kim and I, we were reading this book in Amalfi, Italy. Oh, yeah, in Amalfi, Italy, we were were working on some business things, and we were using the words that work. And, and, you know, the the final note here is the words that work. Um, Frank talked about things that are most important, and we're seeing it with Trump, and we're seeing it in the election, accountability. But more importantly, say what say what you mean and mean what you say. And right. I think the political correctness is finally starting to unravel a little bit. That because it, it's political correctness, <laughs> I, my opinion's been killing us, killing us as a country. Everybody's afraid to say anything. And I had but, I had so many questions. Like I wanted to say, you know, why is uh, Jeb Bush losing? Yeah, it's really an honor to have him on because I met him years and years years ago in CNBC, the financial news station, television station. And we met, and we struck up a good friendship. So he says, I don't do radio because he uses a lot of graphs and charts to tell, tell, tell his story. So it's an honor to have Dr. Frank Luntz on the program. And once again, you know, the radio show is about the good news and bad news about money. We're not political. We're not Republican or Democrat or socialist or communist. Uh, you can listen to the Rich Dad Radio program at your time and your schedule. We have a Rich Dad Radio app available at the ad store. And all of our archi- all of our podcasts are ar- archived at richdadradio.com. The reason we archive them is so you can listen to it again. And like I said, listening to Dr. Frank Luntz right now, regardless of why you listen, is I think he's a very important person to listen to because he gives some tra- tremendous insights, whether you're into politics or you're into business. And I think he offered some tremendous insights as to what's going on in America today. So we've now come into the most popular part of our programs where you get to ask your questions at is Ask Robert. You can submit your questions to rich, at richdadradio.com. So, Melissa, what's the first question for Ask Robert today? Thanks, Robert. Our first question today comes from Ethan in Indianapolis, Indiana. Favorite book, Midas Touch. He says, Robert, your friend Donald Trump says he's going to make America great again. What would you do to make America great again? Well, Donald and I have written two books together, and we don't. You know, we're both entrepreneurs. If you read our first book together, it was called uh, "Why We Want You to Be Rich." And the reason we wrote "Why We Want You to Be Rich" is because you only have two choices today: rich or poor. Middle class is shrinking, as you know, and the poverty in America is exploding. I think two out of three people in America cannot pay their bills right now. And so, what Donald and I come together on is a need for financial education in our school systems. And as you know, he had a rich dad, and I had a rich dad. And what we, what our dads taught us, is different than what my poor dad taught me. I mean, education is more important than before, as you know. Donald says, "I went to an Ivy League school, and I am very, very smart." You know, he has no problem with his self-esteem. I can't say that, but anyway, he is very committed to financial education. So that's why we wrote. You know, why we want you to be rich and Midas Touch, which is about entrepreneurship. So Trump is a committed – I mean, he's not he's not doing this on stage. He and I are sitting backstage. We, we've traveled the world together speaking as far as away as Australia. 
and we get we spent a lot of time together, and I get to know the man very well. He is a fantastic human being. His kids are fantastic. His his office staff is fantastic. They love the guy. I mean, he is a very good leader, right, Kim? He is a very good leader, and and I like the question too. What would you do to make America great again? Because you look at this country, and I still am a big believer that if you focus on entrepreneurship, I mean, this is how people got started here. There was a there was this American dream, and you could make it here, and you could start your own business. And um, I think that focus goes back to small business and entrepreneurship is number one. And I also think you talk about the education system. It, it's, it's, it's broken. Everybody wants to reform it. It's not – you can't – nothing's worked yet. Reform – got to transform. It's got to transform. It's got to be totally, like, blown up and redone again. Um, and it's not are, all millennials. But a lot of them come out horribly prepared with a bad attitude, expecting money for nothing, yeah. you know, checks for free. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> There's a new song. Yeah. So anyway, um, that's why we love Donald Trump. I'm not encouraging you to vote or not vote for him, but I think his his book should be words at work. It's not what you say, it's what people hear. You know, Trump will say something, he'll get in a lot of hot water, and he'll turn it around to make it a positive. Like we're just talking about how England wants to ban him from coming to England right now. He's going to take that and make it a political issue, and he'll make he'll become a hero again. You know, I mean, the man understands words that work. Well, and you've said before, you said, Robert, that a lot of politicians, they they say what you th- what they think you want to hear. They're saying what you th- they think you want to hear, but Donald is saying what's already in your mind. He's al- he's out there saying it, and he's, as, as um, Frank Lund said, he's, he says what he means, and he means what he says, yeah. and that makes all the difference. So if you want to find out what Trump does, get that book, Words That Work. It's not what you say, it's what people hear, because he says a lot of, you know, quote-unquote, shocking things, but it works for him. Next question, Melissa. Our next question comes from Susie in Red Oak, Iowa. Favorite book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. She says, you predicted the financial meltdown of 2016, but do you think Obama can and will prop up the economy? That's a fantastic question, you know, because every presidential year, which we're in right now, election year, the party in power does not want a market crash. So in other words, not Obama, it's Hillary. You know, if the market crashes in 2016, Hillary's toast. You know, so they're going to do, they're going to get the Fed to print more money. They're going to get the CEOs to prop up, you know, buy more. Uh, they, they repurchase their stocks, give this false indicator that the price of their shares is going up. But they're all going to screw the economy just to get elected. So could it happen in 2016? Possibly, but the Democrats surely don't want it, whereas it would elect Trump. Yeah, if that, it that's a great point. I, I haven't thought about that. If the economy crashes this year, they know Hillary can't fix it, but they're going to look for somebody business savvy, smart, who they think can turn it around, and that's going to be Trump. So, so, so the answer is historically, uh, presidential elections are always manipulated by the party in power to keep the market propped up. But as you know, Brazil's in trouble, Puerto Rico's in trouble, pensions are bankrupt, two or three Americans can't pay their bills. And they keep propping it up, which makes the rich richer, which is why we have the Rich Dad radio program. You know, we're not saying what they do is fair, but I'd rather be rich than get creamed right now. So the answer is yes, they'll keep propping it up. But if it doesn't work, Trump's in. Next question, Melissa. Our next question comes from Darren in Ahwatukee, Arizona. Favorite book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. He asks, does it matter to you who wins the next election? Uh, personally, no, but I do I do know it makes a difference. And the reason is is because the president of the United States has less and less power today. What's more important, why we have the Rich Dad Radio program, is what does it matter to you? What are you going to do about it? You know, if Hillary gets in, it's gonna, something's going to happen. If Trump gets in or Ted Cruz gets in, you know, so what? What are you going to do about it? That's kind of my attitude. So I don't get too much in a lather about politics. Kim does, right? I, I get a little more worked up about it, but it would be fun to have a president who takes my phone call. <laughs> I would like that. <laughs> but it really, I, I do believe this is kind of a turning point because we really are getting away from political correctness. Um, if Trump was to get elected, it's going to shake things up tremendously. If Hillary gets elected, I think we're going to get more of the same old, same old. So I, I think this could be a turning point. From my point of view, when you look at you know what's going on in the big picture, we basically have Marxists, you know, the Cam- Communist Manifesto face versus Ayn Rand, Atlas Shrugged. And we have the rich versus the communists. 
And I'm not saying communists are bad people. You know, I mean, it's the people who, who believe in government, government should control everything, that things should be fair and all that. And well, the, the millennials, the millennials yeah. want income equality. They want everybody to be equal. Fair. That's but communism. they don't want to work or they don't want to do anything. Yeah, that's communism. I'm not saying it's bad. So there's two books you haven't read on. One is called The Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx. The other one is uh, Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. And that's what's going on today, you know. People hate the book Ayn Rand is because the capitalists were such mean people. Well, that's what the, the socialists think. You know what I mean? And the capitalists think that the socialists or communists are a bunch of lazy, you know, greedy crybabies. <laughs> greedy. So it's it's really that's what's going on. It's been going on. It'll always go on. You know, we we'll always have the rich versus the poor. At Rich Dad Radio, we'd have you, we'd rather have you be rich. Ask question, Melissa. Our next question comes from Kimberly in Bakersfield, California. Favorite book, Rich Dad Guide to Investing. She said, I've read your book, Prophecy, and your predictions for 2016. Now that it's here, what advice do you have to survive in this current economy? Well, thank you for reading Prophecy, because that book I started, as Kim knows, back in 1997 or 8, you know, when the economy was red hot. You know, there was, you know, what's his name, Greenspan. He goes up there and says, well, you know, rational exuberance and all that. Well, he was, the Fed was pumping the stock market propping up out of sight. So when you feed the stock market free money, what it's called the Greenspan put, that means if you if the market crashes, Greenspan will bail out the rich. That's what it meant. So it wasn't that hard to write Rich Dad's Prophecy 16 years earlier. I didn't think it would come true necessarily so accurately. So here we are in 2016, and I, be, I based Prophecy on the fact that the 401k is going to go broke and so are many pensions. And those are demographic issues, means it's the people issues, things you cannot change. I mean, you cannot take a 65-year-old who has no money and put money in his pocket right now. They're toast. So what are you going to do about it, you know? So that's why I wrote Rich Dad's Prophecy. So what can a person do? Well, it depends on how old you are, how ambitious you are, and how much education, how much study you're going to do. If you, want, if you don't want to do anything, Vote for Bernie Sanders. Any comments, Kim? <laughs> well, you know, it's an interesting question because what do you do today? And, and you know, we've had some, some pretty famous stock people on our program. Um, and one thing they have said is if this, if this crash happens, you do not want to be in the stock market unless you know how to use the stock market and do the options and all that. But if you're the average investor and you're just – if you're just parking your money there, the people that we've had on our show who are the experts are saying that you could lose 40 to 50 percent of what you got in there. So that's one thing I would pay attention to. But that's also in real estate. You see, real estate yeah. is dependent upon jobs. Yep. So people say, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I did what you said. I'm buying real estate. I said, not now. You know, the question is, let's say I'm correct and Rich Dad's prophecy does come true in 2016. The question is, how many jobs will be lost? And so if you're in a town where you know, the factory or whatever it is loses most of his job, that real estate is going to crash with it. So that's why Rich Dad is not about recommending real estate, stocks, bonds, mutual funds. We're educational. We do not give advice. We don't tell you what to do. So please be smarter. The first thing you can do is pay attention and know that we're probably in the most volatile times in world history. I mean, China is having trouble right now. Puerto Rico is going to go bust. Greece is going bust, Stockton, Vallejo, Detroit. I mean, how many more times you got to look at it? And like I said earlier in the question, we have today socialists, you know, the communist Karl Marx versus uh, Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged. The capitalists are saying, screw you, and the socialists are saying, screw you too. So the question is, what are you going to do? Next question, Melissa. Our next question comes from Deanna in California. Favorite book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. She asked, do you think it's wise to pull out of my 401k plan and invest in either gold, silver, or real estate? Absolutely not. You know, you'll be penalized coming out of your 401k plan. Look, that's, that's what they call it, jumping out of the pan into the fr fire. Rich Dad Radio makes no recommendations. We definitely do not recommend you get out of your 401k. If you have no financial education, it might be your best option, but that's up to you and your financial planner, and hopefully your financial planner knows more than you, which might be questionable. So the thing to do right now is, as we always say, it's time to get a little bit educated. You know, I would, you know, listen to the Rich Dad radio program. You have to decide, as Kim says, this market is an all-time high. 
you know, maybe it's time to learn how to make money when the market comes down, but that takes three to four or five years to practice. That's that's what our friend, what's his name? Uh, Bert Doman and, and uh, Andy Tanner, our Rich Dad Advisor. Yeah. That's what they do. And uh, Alexander Elders. And Dr. El Alexander for a Elders, living. Says, he says it's about five years. I mean, it's like a college degree. So if you don't know how to trade options coming down or short the market or invest in real estate and all this, I always recommend, you know, invest in your education, financial education. I wouldn't go to college necessarily, but it might work. Or vote for Bernie Sanders. Next question, please. <laughs> I just want to say one thing is that a lot of people, I mean, it's a great question because a lot of people don't even realize that their 401k is in the stock market. I mean, the 401k is made up of stocks, mutual funds in the stock market. So if this baby does, if the stock market does crash, your 401k could be toast. So this is the time to not panic and make a, a uh, make Snapped a stupid to... decision based with no education, but it is the time to get educated. And the reason I chose 2016, because that's the year the first baby boomer turns 20, 70 and a half. The first baby boomer turns 70 and a half, approximately 40 million baby boomers have a 401k. So when you turn 70 and a half, the 401k rules require you to start withdrawing. Now, it's not rocket science. If the if the old guys are pulling their money out and you're putting your money in, can the market go up? I don't know. I don't think so. But it's up to you to decide. So it's a demographic issue. On top of that, you have corruption in Wall Street, Washington, and in most governments. Huge corruption. You know, people are just so greedy today. It's disgusting. I don't blame them for being greedy because people are desperate for money. So that's why I wrote Rich Dad's Prophecy. The job of a prophet is to be wrong, but unfortunately, I think I might be right. Let me And let me ask, ask you, too, because she asks about gold and silver. What, well, what's, your, what's your take on gold and silver in well, 2016? Well, you still get educated, too. I right? know, I know, but... Gold and silver is not an investment. I say this all the time on Rich Dad Radio. Gold and silver is called a hedge. If you think, you think uh, whoever is elected president next... Well, is going to save the U.S. dollar, then you don't have to buy gold and silver. But you look at Europe right now, it's better to have gold and silver because they're, we're in a currency war and they're going to stop, start dropping the value of the currency, which makes gold and silver more valuable. So I look at gold and silver not as an investment, but as insurance. If the next president really screws up and the dollar crashes or the yen or the euro crashes or the peso crashes, you're going to wish you had more gold and silver. But it's an insurance program not an investment necessarily. Next question. Our next question comes from Pastor Champ in Tennessee. Favorite book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It says, do you think anarchy, the lack of organized government, not chaos, is a better environment for capitalism to thrive? Or do you think a certain amount of government is vital to the success of capitalism? <laughs> That's a heck of a question. That's a very good question. Yeah. Uh, there's two po That's a two opposing forces like communism and capitalism. There's two opposing forces today. You have authoritarianism or totalitarianism, which is King Jong-il in North Korea. He's a totalitarian guy. So was, what's his name, uh, Saddam Hussein. They were dictators. So you have authoritarianism, and if you don't have authoritarianism, when, when they blew out Saddam Hussein, then you have anarchy. So you have a choice between totalitarian dictator or anarchy. And the reason we have ISIS today is because somebody named George W. went there and took out Saddam, but didn't replace him with a strong totalitarian guy. So that gave a, created a vacuum. And ISIS is made up of Iraqi soldiers who don't like those guys fighting us. They used to fight for us. And that's what happens when you have anarchy and you blow out a dictator. You know, sometimes it's better to have a dictator than anarchy. And that's why I think Putin did a smart job of not blowing out this guy Assad. And that's why many people are looking to Trump. They say, you know, Trump is a strong leader and Jeb Bush isn't. So they're looking for somebody right now who is more of a Putin than somebody who is a nice guy. Because isn't, isn't the question, if there is anarchy, the question is going to be is who's going to rise up? Who's going to be that leader? Somebody and it can will go fill in, the void. Yeah, and it can go in many, many different directions. Like, like this ask it right now, you know, regardless of what city you are in, uh, in right now, but if all the police suddenly said, hey, guess what? We quit. We're not going to protect you anymore. How long do you think it would take before there's anarchy in your streets? It wouldn't be that long. So I always know there's always opposing sides. I say there's always three sides to every coin. There's anarchy and authoritarianism or totalitarianism. 
totalitarianism or despots or dictators. Which one do you want? I think right now we're in between, but that's what the election is about. Do you want another nice guy like Obama or do you want a dictator or an authoritative guy like Trump? That's really the election.